Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets. We're a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston. Join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. It uh, would have been, if this were not Sunday, St. Anthony's Feast Day. Yes. Uh, the whole Sunday takes precedence sort of thing, but it's still, you know, St. Anthony Day. Anthony Padua, right? Anthony Padua. Because there are other Anthony's, Anthony the Desert. And... Yeah. And, and we celebrate them all because we are equal opportunity celebrators. We are equal opportunity uh, patron sainters. Yes. <laughs> and so we, since we have an Anthony, we celebrated by going to get ice cream. We, we went to Walgreens novelty and picked, ice cream up, cones. picked up some, um, what are they called, drumsticks? Yeah, drumsticks. The novelty ice cream cones with uh, chocolate coating and peanuts. Man, those were my favorite when I was a kid. Mm. I didn't really like the peanuts. I used to pick them off. But yeah, as, as the with best everything. part was, was when you get down to the bottom of the cone and there's like that plug of chocolate at the bottom. They do that on purpose. Right. They, to keep the, to yeah. keep the, the ice cream from dripping out. Right. But when I was a kid, we would all get down to the bit and like compare who had the biggest chunk of chocolate at the bottom of their cone. Oh, you didn't just bite that off first? <laughs> what? No, that's the best part. You save it for last. It's the best part. You eat it first. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a monster eats the best part first? You save the best for last. No, the best part is the best part. Jump in on it. <laughs> and thus, our two different philosophies of life. <laughs> our personalities. I do not understand. <laughs> I do not understand. Do you eat the best part first or do you save it for the last? You are a saverer. I am an experiencer. I jump in. Uh, so... <laughs> I mean, I suppose we could have gone out for ice cream. We haven't done that in ages. We could have. The only place really to go, is, or that's really close, is the what's Cold Stone Creamery, okay. which has not been great. The, the, the service isn't great. The ice cream is okay. What really annoys me is that they have basically one serving size, yeah. one scoop size, which is ginormous, and I don't need that much ice cream. Like, it's... Three times as much ice cream as... How ironic is it? You can't buy a gallon of ice cream at the store. They're getting... Then it was a half gallon. Then it was a quart. Now you're getting a pint and a half for the same price. But when you go for a cone, they're getting bigger. Right? <laughs> Isn't that kind of wild? I I actually... Right. I like ice cream places that offer you a very small size. Because... The kitty cone is as big as anyone needs. Well, except the, the last time we ordered a kitty cone... It was too bit too much ice cream. What are people who come from to hear from other countries like in like in Italy? You get a gelato. It's a little. It's we would consider that a kitty cone. It's small. It's a little teeny tiny scoop. It's but, as much as you need. <laughs> and, and you know the nice thing is when it's a small little tiny serving, you can have like three or four or even five flavors of ice cream, but they're all little teeny tiny scoops. So you can have like a bunch of little flavors. You try a bunch of things. And try a bunch of things. Yeah. Well, well, and then there's the whole. It melts too quick when it's just a giant cone. Like, who, who can eat that fast? You get an ice cream headache. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the, so there's so this Cold Stone. There is that place down in Bridgewater. The, uh, we went there once. Pleasant Meadows, I think it's called. Right. Not too far. You could do that. There must be other ice cream places around. But this worked. It was easy enough and cheaper. And and he was happy, and we we were all happy. We ate them in the backyard, and we had a nice... Yeah, they were, and then they got to play with the new <laughs> swimming masks. Oh, yeah, I also picked up some some goggles while we were at Walgreens, because I keep... The last time we were at my brother's yeah. house swimming last week... Was it last week? I think it was last, last week. week. Uh, we this. didn't have enough <laughs> swimming goggles, and frankly, I'm getting to the point where I want swimming goggles. Because my eyes are always burning after being in the pool. So, yeah, maybe. So, St. Anthony's Feast Day. Then also this week was Isabella's Baptism Day. And uh, yeah, that was the, the 11th. The 11th. Right. And uh, also, that's also the anniversary of my first day working at the Archdiocese uh, 13 years ago. 
Right. Wow. Right. That's a long time ago. This year, And this year it fell on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, so it was like a double mm. whammy. And for that, you got a pint and a half of ice cream. <laughs> right, right. She wanted Oreo cookie ice cream. She, she, she wanted the Oreo cookie ice cream. And the container was shaped like the ones that, you know, what did it used to be, like two quarts or a half gallon? A half gallon. That's, that's literally the same thing. Right. Oh, that is like the same thing. <laughs> Duh. Um, but, but it was a pint and a half. Like they had shrunk the two quarts into a pint and a half. Oh, my gosh. It's it was just, ridiculous. It, it which was, was enough for everybody to have a small bowl of ice which cream. Which is as much as we need. But, right. but, there's, but you're, we're still paying for the same size, like what we got for two quarts last time. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> So, so hey, can you celebrate while we rant about <laughs> things getting smaller. So uh, so we did that, and then Friday also, which was a few cigarette heart. I I managed to get all my work done early, most early in the week, and I only had a little bit to do Friday morning. So we decided to take the day, the afternoon, really, the from afternoon. lunch on, yeah, to go for a ride, and we went back to Situate Lighthouse, which we went to. Literally, we didn't even realize this. Literally, a year ago, the same, like, a day off. Like, w one day the, off. The, the next, yeah, the next the, day off. The same Friday a year ago. <laughs> right. Which, that was really funny that we kind of decided to go. Uh, but it was uh, it was not the best day of the week. It was it was a little cloudy when we got it was, there. It was fine. It was a little breezy. It was nice. <laughs> It was, it was, it was breezy, uh, but we, it just as a reminder, so it's a lighthouse you, and then there's a long jetty that you can walk out on. And at the end of it is an, an aid to navigation. That's like a framework. looks like a um, scaffolding there, but a lot more sturdy, of course. And uh, the kids had a blast running like gazelles, like, like mountain goats leaping from rock to rock. Uh, we took it slow because we're a lot older and wiser. Yes. And uh, older. And older. And uh, yeah, that was that was nice. And then I think of other like, so, oh, then on the way home, we want, I wanted to get a Dunkin Donuts frozen coffee because I'm addicted to that now. And uh, we we kind of drove around looking for one because it's this thing. It's like we're in Massachusetts. Just drive around a little bit and you'll run into one. That's the, pretty much how it works, which into a Dunkin Donuts, into a Dunkin Donuts. Right. And that's what we did. We found Dunkin Donuts. OK, so here's the question. As we were driving around, we're driving through this. It's situated as kind of a wealthy seaside town. And all the houses, vacation homes and regular homes, have names on them. They're like names. Like this tiny little cottage with two bedrooms. Intrepid. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> to gallant. <laughs> you know, they have these like these very like uh, grandiose names for all these houses. And, and the question is, is. How far can you go from the ocean and still name your house without it being weird? Like, does do you have to be in sight of the ocean? Do you have, or just be in the same town that touches the ocean? Uh-huh. You this is this is your like weird theory. <laughs> You're right. Well, no, it's not a theory, it's a question. Like, uh -huh. I think about these things. You know, do you, is it if you're in like the the area called the South Shore of Boston, which we're in, even though we're half an hour from the ocean, and there's like three towns between us and the ocean. Um, I th can we name our house? That's really what I'm getting to. I want to name our house. No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, SS you, Titanic. You you could, <laughs> but it would be weird. And I want to put up a signal mast, like with the signal flags on it in the front yard. You, All the neighbors be like, I want to make the, be like the guy in Mary Poppins with the cannon on the, the roof. The admiral? The admiral in the roof, keeping time for Greenwich. Okay, but he was an admiral. And I can get a hat. You are not an admiral. <laughs> I'm neither an admiral, admiral or an admirable for, for that. I'm, I mean, I'm really he, was, he was supposed to be a real admiral. He was right? literally a retired admiral. I, right. I get that. Okay. I get that. You're not. <laughs> So, is there like a law against being keeping time on your roof with a can? Well, there probably is a law against keeping time on your roof with a cannon. I'm pretty sure there are ordinances about shooting off cannon in the city limits. I could like organize the kids. Although, evidently, one of our neighbors doesn't realize oh, that because there, there are plenty of people in in our town who don't know that. <laughs> yeah, there, there, are, there the are fireworks. There, there. Are, it sounds like a cannon. People are setting off quarter sticks. I mean, that's got to be a quarter stick of dynamite. That, that's loud. It's very loud. Uh, it, it, I have to say, okay, knock on wood. <laughs> we're, what, two weeks out from the 4th of July or so? 
maybe three, two, uh, three weeks. Okay, I'm looking at the calendar. Three, like we're basically three weeks off of the fourth. No, we're exactly three weeks off the fourth of July. No fireworks yet. Last year was really quiet. Yeah. Uh, well, last year I attributed to nobody could go out of state to get to buy fireworks. Right. They illegally. couldn't go to they could they couldn't go to New Hampshire. So the, the right. because because the border was closed. For those who don't know, you can't buy fireworks in Massachusetts. It's not legal to buy fireworks here, and it's illegal to go to another state and bring them back. But people do it anyway. People do it anyway. Of course. They Even do. though the state troopers sit on the border, they, they have a guy sitting in the parking lot writing down Massachusetts license plates and then sit on the border and pull over those people as they come back. And yet somehow they still manage to bring fireworks back. Well, there's a lot of ways back through, and they're not doing it like literally every minute of every day. But yeah, it's still a bad, bad idea. But people manage it, and they set off the fireworks in in our neighborhood. Um, so I'm I'm in it. I'm in. I'm doing it. And I'm going to form our our kids into a pirate crew, and we're going to board the neighbors. <laughs> Boarding parties, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even talk. I'm I'm laughing too hard. All right, mates, you dogs, scurvy dogs. Not you, the dogs in the neighbor's yard. They're really gross. No. <laughs> hey, if they can have dogs that yap all hours of the day and night, I can have a cannon. All right. We're, we're way off. Rat hole. All right. How much caffeine have you had today? Uh, I had two cups of coffee. I had my coffee before church, and then I had iced coffee when I got home, and that's it. Hmm. And then I've had a lot of iced tea, mm-hmm. and I had Adele's Lemon Shandy, which was really good. Narragansett, gotta get, gotta grab a Gansett. Narragansett Brewery in Rhode Island, famous uh-huh. local place. Dell's Lemonade. They get together. They made a shandy. Yum. I'm not. I am not. Uh, I'm. What are we? I'm man enough to say I like a shandy, which is a fruity beer. Sort of. Sure, it's lemon. It's a citrusy beer. I don't like grapefruit ones, and it, but I can't have grapefruit anyway. Anyway, moving on. On Friday. I was on the Catholics of Oz podcast. Our friends, Lindsay, Lino, and Carolyn. Caroline, sorry, Car- Caroline. <laughs> I mispronounced your name. And th- those are our friends for, uh, who are fellow SQPN podcast. They are from Melbourne, Australia, and uh, they invited me on their show. You know, I still have not listened to one of their shows, and that's really like... They listen to yours, you know. Now you're embarrassed. <laughs> I know, I am. <laughs> you know, I just... Start with Let's Science. I, I That's really their should. other new I show. Just, I, I need to remember to to download it to my I get to a, my iPad. You don't listen uh, to my, my yeah my, Ca- not my, my iPad my your phone my phone. Le- okay. Carolyn Lindsay Lino, don't don't be offended. She doesn't listen to my podcast. You know you did you did a radio show for how many years? I did a radio show for what three years? I listened to two episodes. Yes, and Total. neither one were ones that I were on. I was on. <laughs> yeah, I'm really bad about listening to podcasts. I I listen to the Daily Poem, which is about like less than ten minutes yes. long, and occasionally to Mysterious World, which is um much longer, an hour and a half usually. But really, the the length of it, like I I often say, I could listen to Mysterious World, but I wouldn't be able to finish it. So now I'm just gonna. Well, you just listen to it without the feedback, which you normally, uh, or. Uh... So American Catholic History, 20 minutes. Let's Science, 20 minutes. Definitely, you're going to have to listen to the episode of Catholics of Us that I'm on, though, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. I'll put that right on my calendar. So I'll, I'll let you know when it's ready. I'll, I'll put it right on your phone for you. I'm sure you will. Yes. So I was on, and it was a lot of fun. We had a blast. We talked about a lot of the different shows on the network and what things that's going on. It was fun. Uh, talking to the future. They were in the future. They're in the future now. Right now, it's Monday for them, even though it's Sunday for us. Right. Anyway, uh, one of the things that was interesting was talking about the vaccination and the COVID re- differences. So they they had a period of time when their their lockdown ended, even though they hadn't had a vaccination. But they got to like zero daily cases in Victoria, like without a vaccination. Wow, it was pretty awesome. And then they got to, but then they've been locked down again. There's been cases, and they were only just now getting the vaccine in. Right. So. Like they have restrictions, like they can't go more than twenty five kilometers from home. They can go out, but almost everything is closed, so there's no reason there's nowhere to go. Uh, like you know, like like it was for us here. Right, like that's like my friends in Canada. It's yeah, been, it's been pretty locked down there too. So uh, I think it was Lino who asked me, like, so with your vaccination, do you like when you're out? Do you have to show your card to the police? Do they ask for it? I'm like, 
Mm. No. <laughs> that would not fly here. Americans have very, very, very strong opinions about having to show ID to oh. authority figures. Papers, please, is that is the way it sounds to us. Like the, that's the whole Soviet Nazi thing that we conjure in our mind from our movies and TV shows. Right, right. It, it con like the idea of having to show papers is like the Indiana Jones. Uh, what in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? He didn't okay. have his. Pa he throws the guy out of the, the oh, yes. airship because he does. And he no says, papers. "No papers, <laughs> right?" Like that's. I think that's the the image that like, most papers? Americans have. <laughs> Yes, we did. We are. We are. Yeah. I mean, like if a policeman asks for your your license and there's a he's pulled you over or something, we'll we'll do that. But in general, I mean, even actually police can't ask, just ask for your license. They have to have a probable cause. They have to have an investigation that they're undertaking. They have to have a reason. They can't just randomly. I need to see your ID. Right. Like if you're just walking down the street, you're not driving a vehicle. Right. They can't stop you. And you can't just stop ID. you and say, I, w I want to see your ID. You can't. Like. You, you are you are you are you undertaking the investigation? There has to be some sort of violation that they're investigating. So, um, so uh, yeah, that uh, it's all the honor system. So basically, everybody can go anywhere at any time, even if they're not vaccinated, because it's the honor system. Although, really, around here, like, so people who have their vaccines are not required to wear a mask. Yeah, it's the opposite. Yeah. But but what I'm finding is that when I go to the store, I'm like the only person not wearing a mask in the store. People are 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 like afraid to give up their mask. Like you're vaccinated. Well, it's, I, it's don't been the, I don't know. I don't know for sure that, that it's been in the paper. Like it's right. like they've been interviewing but, but people. Any given any given person in the oh, store, sure. I don't know for right, sure. Right, right, right. But but in the newspaper, you have these like interviews with people and it's like, no, I'm I'm afraid to give up my mask. And uh, like you're vaccinated. <laughs> You're fine. Go ahead, let it go. Let go of your of your uh, your uh, your security pinky, blanket. Your security blanket. Like you can let it go now. You're it's we're good. <sighs> I don't know. It's just again, some people have uh, they have um what's the word uh, conditions, compromised immune systems. Yes, that sort of thing. and that and so it's even right. more important, even though they've been vaccinated. I get that. But the, but the, clearly the interviews show that there are people who it's not about that. Even worse is the people like, I don't want to look like those other anti-vax people, so I'm continuing to wear my mask. Like, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> but, you know, all right. You, you do you. Yeah, anyway. But, so, anyway, Catholics of Oz was great. That interview should be out in a few weeks. They have the episode with Archbishop Comensoli first. Evidently, the Archbishop gets top billing over me. Yeah, well, yeah. <sighs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Anyway, <laughs> I think it's awesome. They've had him on twice. He's asked, actually asked to be on their show. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, he asked them. So, yeah, it's really good. They get, Can they I get, be on your show, please? Yeah, they're getting, he's recognized them as, as providing a really great, you know, apostolate to his diocese. And I think it's awesome. I think more people should listen to the show. Including you, so I mean, I'm I'm curious just because I, I'm kind of fascinated with with all things Australia. So I know a lot of Americans are, which is one of the things I I, I like about the show is, is Americans love Australia. It's as as I said when we were talking, it's a country where everything wants to kill you, but the people are really nice. My, my cousin actually immigrated to Australia. Wow, so my my cousin Nicole, she she lives there now. Does she have a kangaroo? She does not have a kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> no. Sorry, playing dumb American like with Canadians. Do you have an igloo? <laughs> Do you have sled dogs? I used to tease my friend Zoe uh, all the time about uh -huh. that. She's from uh, PEI. Anyway, let's talk about the library book sale. Yes, finally. I I started. This isn't buying last, books, by no, the way. No, no. <laughs> last spring, I started loading up a box full of books that I wanted to give away. I was, like, tidying up, and I was clearing the shelves, and I was so very happy. This is what we do. Books come in, books go out. Right. And then COVID hit, and the library shut down, and this bo box has been sitting in my bedroom for more than a year, and... And there was a box even, in the car. Right. And there was another box in the car, and even after the library started reopening, like... They they opened the lobby, but they they shut off the stack so you couldn't browse, but you could go in and pick up books that you put on hold, or that they could go get books off the shelf for you. Mm -hmm. Um, but then the the book sale the book sale tables were all closed, covered over with tarps. So finally, they've decided to reopen the book sale. 
uh, now that the governor has re- lifted all the restrictions. Yes. And the Friends of the Library announced that they were now collecting donated books. And so I happily trotted over <laughs> and to... And we said, <laughs> I happily trotted over to the library on Saturday morning and dropped off my one big box and a couple of smaller boxes of books. I probably could have found more oh, books yes. on the shelf to give away, but... I'm just looking through this room that we're sitting in. <laughs> um, but I was kind of busy this week, and I didn't yeah. really have a chance to do a thorough scouring of the shelves. But I'm, I'm still happy I got rid of the big box that's been like an albatross around my neck. Mm. And someone will get some nice books. Ho- hopefully somebody will appreciate them. Yes. And the library will make some money. And... Gosh, I remember a few years ago, I brought like four big boxes to the to, to them. I'm like, here's your books. I mean, it was a lot. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's good. Good. We're get, getting things back to normal, cleaning some stuff out. Um, I just mentioned summer of scouting. We I had a meeting the other night with the uh, the committee for the kids pack cup scout pack and the boys troop so there was there's a lot of overlap as you might guess between the two families and uh, at a at a restaurant which was fun to be able to do that and wow there's a lot going on there's a trip on the a harbor boat trip to george's island on july 2nd there is a uh, scout camp and then there's another camping trip that's going to be a canoe camping to an island in on a lake in new hampshire and oh my gosh all this stuff and they're doing fundraising and they're it's like it but like every weekend is something it's kind of kind of nuts so <laughs> It's the summer school. Like, it's like, finally, we can do things. Let's do everything. So all the things that we we, we would have done this summer and all the things we would have done last summer. Too. <laughs> right, right. This is what we're doing. Like, pace yourselves, people. Pace yourselves. Don't burn yourselves out. Yeah. I don't think they're going to burn out. I think we were. <laughs> we're going to burn out. <laughs> yeah. The kids might burn out. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, so that's the, the summer. I'm going to the summer of scouting. Uh, all right, let's move on. Talk about food. Tonight for dinner, I made something new. Uh, it was a recipe from America's Test Kitchen called Charcoal Grilled Barbecued Chicken Kebabs. Kebabs! And uh, so this was, I think, a, a success. Pretty much everybody liked it. Except, except Ben. Except Ben, which, who's a hard sell on things in general. Uh, but uh, but everybody else enjoyed it. I think Ben, like maybe another time, might... He was having a hard night. He was having a hard night, yeah. So it has. So you make a barbecue sauce, ketchup, molasses, onion, Worcestershire, Dijon, mustard, cider vinegar, brown sugar. You make a, a, a sauce. Uh, and then for the kebabs, this was interesting. So you take the meat, uh-huh. cube it, and then salt it, let it sit in the fridge for, uh, you know, an hour or so, and then dry it off. And then there's a mixture of sweet paprika, sugar, smoked paprika th- th- for the dry ingredients. And then you, this was interesting. You take two slices of bacon and you process them into a paste in the food processor. Uh huh. And then you coat the the paprika mixture with the, and the bacon w- onto the chicken. And so what happens is as it cooks, the 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 fat from the bacon basically keeps the chicken moist. So it doesn't dry out too much. So it wasn't too dry. This this sounds like a recipe that's not a quick recipe, though. It it's not the quickest recipe, uh, but it wasn't too bad. I I think it would it went pretty pretty fine. I don't think yeah. I'm it, just wondering. It, this doesn't sound like a like a weeknight recipe. Um, how long did it take me? I think I started around four thirty, and we ate around six. I mean, I. I was steadily doing things like going from one thing to the next to the next. So it's not like I could make other dishes in that time. Right. So I, I it, made some coleslaw and some potatoes. Right. But I I liked it. It was good. I think it, it was uh, tasty. Yeah. It wasn't too spicy. We have some, some spice averse uh, eaters and uh, it wasn't, we got the, the, uh, the sign of approval on that. So it worked out. I, I liked it. And, uh, it was it was fairly easy to cook. I didn't it w- it didn't burn or anything like that. I I followed the the uh, well I followed my best instincts on cooking it and and kind of right. a little bit of what they were saying in the in the instructions. But yeah, 
So good. I, I find instincts are often better than instructions. Yeah. Well, I've been I've been grilling long enough. Like I know what I I, I know when something is going to burn and when it isn't. Where to put it on the grill and that sort of stuff. With the charcoal. So I got enough experience there. So charcoal grilled barbecued chicken kebabs. So you made pistachio muffins this week. I did. I love pistachio muffins. But they're one of those things where all the recipes I can find online start with boxes of pistachio pudding. I have not found a pistachio muffin recipe that doesn't require pistachio pudding. Mix. I'm not I'm not sure you could make it pistachio-y enough, that's a word, without pudding. Right. So I got had you get a couple boxes of pistachio pudding and mm-hmm. I made a double batch of muffins. Now I kind of I think that the batter was too thick. And I think part of the problem was that I was using the pullet eggs, which are really small. And I used it called for four eggs and I used five. But I think I probably should have bumped it up to six or seven. Yeah, they were really little eggs eggs are small. And so the the batter was a little bit too thick. And. um, So it didn't rise, really? No, they rose really beautifully. They were just a little bit dense. Okay. The other thing is, I think. Next time I make them, I'm going to add a little bit of extra almond extract to bump up the flavor a little bit. Okay. Like it was pistachio-y, but it wasn't as... As nutty. As nutty as the muffins I've had in the, like, from the grocery store. Like I wonder the if, they, if they sell pistachio extract. But honestly, I, based on flavor, I think that the pistachio muffins in the bakery are using almond extract. Like, the, the, the nutty flavor is bitter almond. It's not right. pistachio. Right. Cook, I think because cooked pistachio is one of those things that doesn't really taste very pistachio-y. Like, yeah, our brain doesn't say, that's pistachio nut. No. It's like so really, pumpkin pie. Right. It's, I, I think the bitter almond is the way to go. Yeah. Well, they don't sell pistachio extract. They don't. <laughs> I, I could have told you that. Yeah. But it was good. I liked it. I think everyone liked it. Except for Lucy. Except for Lucy, <laughs> who is a very hard sell with muffins. She's a tough customer. Uh, she's like, mm, she didn't take a little nibble, and she said, no, I don't like this. <laughs> Everyone else loved them, though. Uh, well, I'm not going to call her Sweet Tooth. That's my segue. Okay. Into what I watched this week. There's a new Netflix series. Called Sweet Tooth? Called Sweet Tooth. It's not a documentary. So it's a post-apocalyptic sort of thing. Is it? So it's it's fiction? It's fiction. Okay. So it posits a pandemic, much worse than the one we've just gone through, where uh, there's no cure and it's very virulent and, and it, transmission is much faster. Movie, movie pandemics are always worse than the one we've just well, been through. Well, otherwise it's not all that dramatic. <laughs> right. I mean, I have to say that like the pandemic has been bad, but not like movie, oh, movie pandemic well, bad. Well, even just in, by historical measures, going get, you know getting off of the movie topic for a second by historical measures this has not been a very bad pandemic it's not it it is not it's not black death level it's pandemic. right it's not the, the transmission rate has but not been high it's, it's got a very long incubation period and all that sort of stuff and yeah it, this was a this is a relatively mild pandemic as pandemics go but right. in this movie or series it's a series on netflix uh it it's much more virulent and it also takes it, at the same time as the pandemic is reaching its worst, uh-huh. there's an there's a event which happens where all of these children being born are being born as animal-human hybrids. What? They're being born with animal characteristics. So some kids will have, have wings, and other kids have uh, um, like rabbit noses, and this, or that's, deer antler nubs. Or That's weird. Yeah. And... At some point, one of the one of the characters is like, "It's Mother Nature who's angry at us for all the bad things we're doing to the planet, and this is her way of cleansing the planet, or something like that." I don't know, uh, but really, what's a, the the most of the story, at least in the first episode that I watched, is this father and son, he and baby, really at, at the beginning, they go out into the depths of Yellowstone, yeah, I think it's Yellowstone uh, National Park, and live there the father's trying to get away from society because things are really bad and they're out there for 10 years 
and uh, he teaches the, the kid never to go beyond the fence, you know, the, the border of the park and, you know, all these things to avoid people. And um, we, we find out that people are hunting these kids for whatever reason. Um, like they're not human, I think. And in fact, to have one of these kids to, who can speak is considered strange, which is very Planet of the apes <laughs> Uh Anyway. I only watched the first episode. A lot happens. I don't want to spoil anything. Um, there's an interesting character who shows up near the end of the episode who I think is going to be there through the se- season. Um, a uh, a former professional football player, like a big linebacker type. Like, you see him early on in in the like on TV in the early part of the episode uh-huh. uh, where he, you know, he's playing football and he's on the screen. But he's sort of in the background. But he's there enough where you're like, there's a reason they're... Where they're kind of showing us this and he shows up later and he's just this guy like he's survived so so many people have died I'm not sure where it's going i'm kind of interested I, I might i might watch another one or two of them but um the, the kid is the kid is endearing no pun intended <laughs> oh my <laughs> i did not intend that pun uh but he's intent on going to find his mother that's that's the uh, that's his mo- it's his quest that's the it's a quest story right right so he's going to go find his mother who's in red rocks colorado or something like that uh so yeah, we'll see how it goes uh so that's what thing something i watched by myself but you and i watched the new disney plus marvel series loki loki the first episode first episode what do you think I liked it. It was, I mean, I didn't know what to expect at all. It was weird. Yes, it was, it had a kind of a sort of surreal Brazil feel to it. (laughs) Yes, yes. Very, Um, very surreal. But not quite as surreal as Brazil. I mean, it wasn't quite that level of. I've only seen clips of Brazil. I've never seen the movie. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, well, considering, yeah. Um. Yeah, I I mean, I like Tom Hiddleston. Loki is a fascinating character. And I mean, just in the first episode, his his emotional, his character arc was pretty interesting. Loki in the first Avengers movie comes across as he's the villain, 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 villain. But over time, he becomes a little, le- little bit less of a villain, a little bit less in each movie. And so by the time Endgame comes around, He's he's not as he's not really a villain at that point. I mean, he's still Loki, which means he's an unpredictable, chaotic character. Right. He's still the trickster guy. But but he's still but he's at, by that point he's kind of on Thor's side. Right. Um. So in this one though, it goes back to the, the timeline is is that he's this is the Loki from the original Avengers movie taken out of time into this place out of time. And so he kind of goes through that journey rapidly in this episode. Which was interesting. Like, they wanted to have the character reset, but they didn't want to completely reset him. So they figured out how to kind of... Rapidly move him along. Take him along some part of that journey. Right. Right. Um, Which was interesting. Like, I, I feel like there's... a. Very similar to the first episode of WandaVision. There's lots of questions and very few answers. Yet. Right. Right. And that's I think that's clearly what they're doing here is they're opening up this box and it's like, we're not telling you much. You just got to trust us. We're going somewhere. Just, just go. You're along for the ride. Right. There's, I, there's And there's going to be a lot more th- under the hood than right. we know. I actually kind of like the experience of going for a ride, not knowing where i'm where a show is going where a story is going well you and i both like lost right even right to the end <laughs> right we're unlike a lot of people i i enjoy sometimes just going into a movie theater cold with no expectation oh, at all that. about movie like i don't like to see the trailer i don't want to read the buzz i don't want to have a synopsis of the plot i don't want to be spoiled at all i want to like I don't know what I'm sitting down and getting I'm, into. I want to experience the movie or show or book as the creator intended it to be experienced, which is as you as it unfolds. Right. I mean, a lot of times, like for WandaVision, I felt like I had read enough of the chatter online, even though I was kind of trying to avoid it, that I had some ideas of what was going on. I mean, yeah. I, I. I was not it was not an unspoiled experience. Right. Let's just say that. 
Um, so I'm kind of glad that I'm I'm caught up now in the in the MCU so that I can watch Loki without being spoiled. You've watched everything. You you watched Falcon and Winter Soldier, right? Wa- yes. Okay. So you've you've seen all the movies. I've seen all the movies except I think the second Ant Man. Okay. You seen Doctor Strange? Yeah. Okay. I kind of wish I'd watch that with you. Um, okay. So yeah. So the second Ant Man. Oh, and I didn't watch the Dark Thor Dark World. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> you don't need to watch it. Don't worry, you didn't miss much. Um, the uh, the second Ant Man is important for Endgame, but since you've already seen Endgame, it's it it sets up Endgame basically, right? Um, but okay, but for, as far as Loki, Owen Wilson is great. I love Owen Wilson. Oh, he's I, so fun. I always enjoy Owen Wilson. Whatever he's I mean, doing. Owen Wilson always plays Owen Wilson though. Yes, he is. He, yeah, he's like Robin Williams. Like we were saying, like. He shows up and you could tell he's ad libbing these lines. Th- that line is so Owen Wilson that nobody could have even written it for him because it's just like so off the wall. But it's yes. totally him. But it it feels like there was a, a line where he's talking to the, the woman who's the judge and he and he kind of says and stops and says aside, I feel like I'm always looking up to you. And it's just the sort of thing that's that some funny guy says to someone right. like off the cuff. Like uh, this, this joke just occurred to me and that's how it comes. And it, and it feels like that's an ad lib line. Right. Now, if that wasn't ad lib, that's a really talented writer who knew how to write Owen Wilson. Let me ask you the nose the prosthetic, nose. his nose in it. Did Owen you notice Wilson's it? Nose? Yeah. It looks like it's broken and bulbous. It does. I uh, don't know. If... Is it just that he's aged a lot since the last time I've saw, seen him in something? I, I don't know. It's very strange. I, why yeah. would I know? I don't know. I'm just I, I'm I'm just throwing out there something I noticed right. in, in this one. Yeah, um, it does, he, he does look like he has a broken nose. I don't know if that's him or a makeup character. If there's a reason for that, yeah. the The TVA, the transient, the the, the time variant authority, as a as a device, interesting. The timekeepers. I gather I'm not a comic book person, so comic book people would know better, but. I gather the timekeepers are the new Thanos, the new the, the new supervillain, the new bad guy. The yeah, to be because what I do know is, is that the next phase of Marvel movies and shows is about the multiverse, right? So the, and and they're the keepers, the timekeepers, and the TVA are the keepers of the multiverse and the sacred timeline. So something tells me they're either they're either allies or they're the, or they're the enemy, and I kind of feel like they're going to be the enemy. So we'll see. Well, there's, they certainly feel Kafka esque, mm-hmm. and um, and arbitrary. Yes, it, it, if they're good, if they're the good guys, then they're actually. You know what they who they remind me of? Um, it, the the they remind me a lot of Umbrella Academy and the the time traveling people there who are like trying to maintain. Yes. Uh, in Umbrella Academy, they have the, the right. time travelers. That's what it reminded me uh, of. Who are trying to maintain the 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 timeline? Yes, yes. Oh, well, right down to the anachronistic design aesthetic. In the Umbrella Academy, it was very sixties. I mean, I know Umbrella Academy is also a comic book thing, right? But it's not Marvel, right? Right. It's no, it's not. It's uh, independent Dark Horse. Or, it was. A, it's a you know. It's a um, graphic novel. So right. But it, but there's a similar feel to it, and I didn't realize this until actually we were, uh, just now. Like yes, I suddenly realized what it, what it was that Loki was reminding me of, and it's Umbrella Academy. It really does. It's got it's got it's a got, similar. Vibe. It's got a time a time authority, a, a timekeeping authority that who have advanced technology, obviously, but, but whose who, design aesthetic is old, is fifty sixty years old, and and who seem kind of. Chaotic, chaotic, and arbitrary, and arbitrary, and, and th- not exactly good. Uh huh. Yeah, that's it's just interesting to think about, huh? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I wonder. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know, like, if this is something that's come. If the Loki stuff comes out of the comic books, I think it does. Does TVA predate the Umbrella Academy? Is, is there an influence going on there, one way or the other? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I have no idea. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good catch, though. That's what it was reminding me of. So Loki is dropping every Wednesday, new episodes. I 
I, I'm, I'm on board. Yeah, me too. Um, all right. So you're still working on your novel. I'm still working on my novel, uh, the third in the Ibis trilogy, which is called Flood of Fire. Uh, I, I have to say, I'm liking this one a little bit less now. Like, there's this whole plot line that I'm just not very invested in, in which two of the main characters who you've met in previous novels are having an adulterous relationship. And I just, it's spending way too much time on that mm. in too much detail. And I just, uh, but the rest of the story is good. I just really kind of want to skip that part of it because I'm not, I don't care. And I really, yeah. Uh. Yeah. Well, it's it, it, interesting. It sounds like the the rare trilogy where the, the the third book is not better than the second book. <laughs> I mean, in some ways it is like I'm I'm seeing where we're going to start to pull the characters together again, who've okay. all been flung apart. But it just this one plot line, I'm I kind of want to make it go away. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's going to be going away soon and I'll be happier. Good. Good. Well, I'm still working on uh, Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Right. It's gotten really good. Like in the, just in the last part of the book, it's mm-hmm. taken a turn in an interesting direction. and. Wow. Like I I just I love his hard science approach to sci-fi with a very fun comedic, you know, edge. Right. It's it's not like slapstick, but it's it's it doesn't take itself seriously. Too much hard sci-fi takes itself way too seriously and becomes right. boring and te- uh, tedious. Uh, this is d- definitely not that. And it's really interesting and I wonder, sometimes I wonder, like the first book, The Martian, he wrote it just as his first novel. But sometimes I wonder, like when someone has a first novel that's huge like that, whether they go and gets made into a movie, whether Mm -hmm. they go into subsequent projects thinking of it, how would this work as a movie? Right. Does this feel, does this have that feel? Like how would it work as a movie? I don't know. I, it would be hard. I, well. It, I don't think it does. I think his second book, Artemis, uh-huh. felt like this. He was making a book that could be made into a movie, but this, there's there's a lot to it that would be hard to do as a movie. I mean, put it, there, there's elements of it that would be hard to do. Not impossible, not today, but with like with Ready Player One and Ready Player Two, Ready Player Two felt like I'm making a book to be made into a movie, mm. and it suffered for that. Uh, it was it was it was not as good. But but uh, so far, Project Hail Mary is good. I'm I'm enjoying it. So that's uh, cool. I'm reading a lot slower this year than I did last year. I'm way behind in my my reading p- progress. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's I have harder, longer books, not harder books, longer books. Could be. I mean, I read the Dresden Files last year, and those went quick. Oh, those are those sixteen. Are I read fast. sixteen, seventeen books, whatever it is, in a month and a half, two right. months. Right. Those are binge books. Yeah. Like you, you really do speed through. They 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 move quickly. I need to do more. I need to spend more time reading as well instead of wasting my time flipping through social media. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we, especially when there's nothing new on social media. What am I flipping on this for? Read your book. Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about today's mass readings, which were really good. This was the parable of the mustard seed today. You know, I've I've heard this one. I can't even tell you how many times. And sometimes you get a new take on something that's so familiar and it's like wow i really just i I'd never thought of it that yeah. way <laughs> yes um so so we had a visiting priest well uh, he's, he's, so he's not a, visiting. he's not a he's not one of our assigned priests but he's he's a retired priest who regularly says mass right he, he fills in father williams father, father william. william williams literally that is his yeah. name <laughs> father william williams or his parents thinking i don't know um <laughs> anyway uh he so he started off talking about like how much things how things are looking up uh the churches are reopening the covid restrictions are being lifted uh vaccination rates are up covid case loads are down things look really good um that was an interesting intro because then he sort of segued into now let's talk about all the bad things let's talk about all the bad (laughs) things let's like think about like flipping through the newspaper or watching tv news and like the world is you know full of all sorts of Really, really wars and violence bad, and pestilence and right bad stuff um and he says you know where is the kingdom of god when you're like flipping through the newspaper and looking at all this bad news 
where is this? Where's God and all that? Yeah. Where, where is the kingdom? And then we talked about the parable of the mustard seed. And he says, you know, it starts really small. It's in the small things. And he talked about like the very sm the small things in which we find, in which we bring the kingdom to those around us. You know, he talked about the temptation to come back with a biting retort when someone has hurt you. And when you push down that temptation and instead you turn to forgiveness and reconciliation, that is the kingdom of God. And I really liked the idea of like personalizing it, making it about me and what I can do in daily life. Every time you don't tweet that snarky comment. Right? <laughs> um, just the very, the little things in which we can bring peace, grace, love, grace to those around us. And yeah. wow, it was really, I mean, I, I feel like I'm not doing it justice because it really was profoundly moving to me. And I don't know that I can convey that in my right. narration of it, my re recounting well, of it. If, I mean, if you want to see it, you go to the uh, Facebook page for St. Edith's Nine Parish in Brockton and look at the recording for the Mass for, uh, I'll see if I can get a link, for the Mass for the June 13th. Right. But I was left with a question, which was the first reading is one I do not remember ever having heard before. And, you know, sometimes readings hit you that way, like, of course, I must have heard it before because it's in the cycle, right? Every three years. But something about it really, like, grabbed my attention. And I just did not remember ever having seen those words before. It's from Ezekiel. Uh, and it starts off with, like much of Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I, too, will take the, from the crest of the cedar, from its topmost branches, tear off a tender shoot, and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It shall put forth branches and bear fruit and become a majestic cedar. Birds of every kind shall dwell beneath it, every winged thing in the shade of its boughs. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, bring low the high tree, lift high the lowly tree, wither up the green tree, and make the withered tree bloom. As I, the Lord, have spoken, so will I do. I mean, that that image of the Lord tearing off a shoot from this really tall cedar from the top of it and then planting it somewhere else. So, so right. we're talking about a well, gardener cutting a, cutting a shoot and then transplanting right. the it. The top of a tree is the growing bit. Right. So he takes the... the the bit of the of the cedar that's still growing, the growth bit. I don't. <laughs> botanists are tearing their heads. Here's a hero right now as I'm saying growth bit, but they mm -hmm. and then plants it and in on the mountain tops of Israel. So Israel is already majestic and big, and but this will grow from that and grow higher. This is a reference to either bo or both Christ and the Church, right? Which grows out of Israel, which grows out of the chosen people. Yeah, and I'm thinking, I'm wondering, too, if the, the image of the cedar on the mountaintop doesn't sort of resonate with the idea of the temple, which was made of cedar? Cedar, um, yes. On the mountain. So so maybe there's that. I mean, I know that you often get this image of the cedars. Cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon. It, but the temple is made from the cedars of Lebanon. Right. So it's interesting, like, like but, God transplanting the, the grand cedar tree. Right. Well, the cedars of Lebanon were, for, for the people of that era, were our sequoia. If you were to trans, translate it to, you know, tr uh, to uh, American idiom, it would be sequoia, the greatest trees. The cedars of Lebanon were famed for their height and, and breadth and their strength. And so right. a, a cedar is a strong tree. And so not only does it resonate with the temple, but it also resonates with the cross and the tree of life of the Garden of Eden which the cross was, which is a type of the cross. Right. So it reminds me of the, the kids book that we have, The Three Trees. Yes. One tree becomes a... Uh, one tree becomes a, a ship. Right. One it becomes the... The, the, um, the ship, and then when it becomes the boat that carries Jesus across the, the Sea of Galilee. Sea. Yeah. There's oh. one that becomes a feed trough, which becomes... Which then later becomes the manger. The, crash, the manger. In which... The baby Jesus is laid. And then the third 
is thrown onto the pile and it seems like it's been discarded discarded and then it's made into a cross and christ is crucified on it which seems like the worst to the tree who wanted to be oh he wanted to be planted on the mountaintop and grow and touch heaven and well i think the the giving tree right. is, is is riffing off of this ver uh this part of the ezekiel possibly yeah because wanted to be on a mountaintop so right, so this this tree is the tree of life, the 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 cross, the church. It's Christ Himself. I mean, it, it carries right. all of those meanings. I, I feel like that Jesus Himself is definitely riffing off this. With the birds of every kind shall dwell beneath it's, beneath it's, it, and it's, every it's, winged right. things in the shade of its boughs. When He tells the parable of the mustard seed, He uses that same imagery of all the birds coming and but and how, roosting in. But how interesting is it? So in the Ezekiel, it's a shoot taken from the grandest of all trees. Right, planted. from the cedar, the, the, the top of the, the, the tallest cedar. Right, whereas this is the smallest seed that, that God is going to take and going to plant and grow a must, you know, the, the mustard plant, which is, in this case, as I looked it up, um, is ex some scientists think it's the black mustard, which is a plant that can grow up to nine feet tall. A bush, it's really a bush. It's not a cedar, it's not a sequoia, but it's still large. And it's something that people hearing this would be familiar with as a very large plant. And the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade. Right. Which is really interesting. Yep. Yeah. Uh, somewhere else, it's, uh, I think a different, one of the other synoptic gospels refers to it as the this mustard seed becomes the largest tree, mm -hmm. which is not technically true, but but poetically speaking, poetically it's, speaking, it's, it, I mean, it, it, I can see where that's also pulling out from the Ezekiel the idea mm -hmm. of this tall, majestic cedar tree, right? So, so yeah, it's I think Jesus is is sort of is saying the kingdom of God grows out of is is this tree of of Ezekiel is the kingdom of God, right? And it grows from a very small little seed that I'm planting here, which... Among he, these disciples. Right. He's planting the seed. The seeds of the kingdom are the parables that Jesus tells. Right. And they're these little tiny stories. There's stories about sowers sowing seeds, and there's stories about, you know, fathers and sons and judges and widows. Right. And they're these little tiny stories, and yet within them contain all the lessons that we need in order to build the kingdom of God right. in our lives. Well, he gives everyone this, what they can, what they're able to handle, what they're able to understand or to take. So they, the, the, the majority of the disciples get the parables, but to his own disciples, he explained them to the, to the apostles. They get, right. the but I love the idea too, that he, he introduces it though, with the idea of a man to scout, would scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He knows not how. Like the, there's this this mystery in the way that the seeds are scattered that like the seed might... Does, it's like chance. Yeah. It, it seems like chance, but it's also sort of this mystery of God where the seeds are planted and then sometime when we're sleeping and going about our business... They're growing, and we're not even necessarily knowing how they're growing. Well, we often talk about that in evangelization, where we share, like, we share our faith with people, and we don't know, like, they could be hostile to it, they could be uh, 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 disdainful of it, and walk away, and you don't know. That's, the seed has been planted, but you don't know when it, it, it will take root, it will grow, and sometime five years down the road, ten years down the road, it will, it will start to sprout. You know, so you never know. And we, I mean, it's the same thing with your own children. You just, you, I, all you can do is, is sow the seed and the Holy Spirit makes it grow at, right. in, in, in the time that the Holy Spirit deems appropriate. So, yeah, um, definitely. So very good, very good, at appropriate uh, reading for this week. I think that should do it. What do you think? Sure. All right, let's take a moment first to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Bets, including Tim and Marie M., Josh C., Mary F., Dustin P., and Timothy B. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give 
make it possible for us to continue raising the bets in all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So uh, if you have any feedback for us, you want to tell us what you think of any of the things we talked about, you can do so by commenting at sqpn.com slash bets, that's B-E-T-T-S, or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash Media, or send an email to bets at sqpn.com. We'll have links to various things that we talked about in our show notes at sqpn.com. Be sure to join the StarQuest fan club. Just text StarQuest to 66866. That's right, send StarQuest to 66866 and just follow the instructions from there. Until next time, I'm Dom Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. <laughs>